Chapter 58, Shopping The two of them eventually crossed into the town after half an hour of briskly jogging through the snow. Ruby could hear Maya muttering under her breath about the damn cold the entire time, only briefly pausing every few minutes to adjust her parka and shiver a little. The town was, for the most part, quiet. The streets were nearly deserted, most people unwilling to face the bitter wind. A few brave souls were vainly attempting to clear the snow building up at their doorsteps, their faces hidden deep within their hooded cloaks as they fought the constant flurry. Maya turned around, her hand clenching the sides of her hood together. Looks like these shops are all closed, she said, her voice muffled. You probably won't have much luck looking for the stores on the list I gave you. If you're feeling better, you could go back to camp for supplies, or you could just rest at home and get some more sleep. Don't worry, I'll find a way to get the supplies, Ruby promised. I'm not going to let you down. Maya frowned a little. Just don't do anything, illegal, alright? Sure. Ruby answered, then whispered to herself, at least I'll try not to. I heard that, Maya said, rolling her eyes. No fair, Ruby complained. You have a hood covering your ears. Maya grinned and turned back around, resuming their walk. A few of the main roads had been half-heartedly cleared with a snowplow, but the sidewalks were still covered in a thick layer of powdery snow. Aren't the roads just going to be covered with snow again? Ruby pointed out. You guys aren't using road salt or anything. Maya shrugged. I don't decide how the town uses the snowplows. I think we have road salt, but no one bothers to use it because so few people even use vehicles here. The police station was just as Ruby remembered it. The dull, rectangular building built with yellow and white brick, the curtained windows faced across the front. An iron fence surrounded the building, and the entrance was a metal gate with a scanner on the side. Well, the lights are on, so someone must have arrived already, Maya decided, pulling out her card and pressing it to the scanner. The gates clicked and began to slide open. See you later, I guess, Ruby said dejectedly, giving Maya a hug. Maya smiled and tousled the young girl's hair. Stay safe. Ruby waved and watched the rabbit faunus longingly until she entered the building. Brushing the snowflakes off of her eyelashes, Ruby took out her tablet and swiped it open. After it loaded up, Ruby opened the message Maya had sent her and began going down the list of potential stores. After a few minutes of browsing and thinking, Ruby realized that the names didn't really mean anything to her. She didn't actually remember their locations or even recognize them. That's fine, I'll just go down the streets I know and see if any of the stores are open, Ruby thought to herself. I'm sure I can find some of the shops that way. She began retracing her steps from the police station, trying to find the butcher shop they had stopped by only two days ago. It took her a while to make her way to the store, but she eventually found her way there. Unfortunately, a closed sign hung in the front window, and the chair behind the counter was empty. Ruby sighed and adjusted the bandages around her eye. Next, she grabbed the doorknob and ripped it off, then smashed her fist through the wooden door and ripped the bolt out. Shaking the wood splinters off of her hand, she pushed the door open and walked inside, taking a quick peek behind her before closing the door. She attempted to shove the bolt back through the ruined door and into the slot in case someone attempted to come inside before setting the doorknob onto the counter. A stack of paper bags lay on the counter. The display cases were empty, but Ruby was sure there'd be meat in the storeroom. If not, well then she'd have to go look for another store, or go hunting. Whichever one was faster. She grabbed two bags and hopped the counter, heading for the door behind it. A hallway was to her left, but she ignored it, assuming that the storage room would be closer to the display cases. The door to the storage room was, surprisingly, unlocked. The odor of frozen meat and blood greeted her as she walked into the decently sized meat locker. Racks of ribs and slabs of meat hanging on the hooks suspended from the ceiling. Her breath fogged the air as she took a deep breath and exhaled it. She looked around the room, wondering what to take. Hung among the produce like another slab of meat was the shopkeeper, his arms impaled on two of the hooks, a third hook going through his back. Blood slowly dripped out of his lacerated arms and the multitude of holes decorating his body. He was nearly naked, only wearing a pair of boxers, as though he had been dragged out of his bed. Ruby blinked in surprise and moved forward, extending a hand to touch the bare faunus's body. 
His pale skin was cold, his eyes closed. Yet in spite of his deathly appearance, his body suddenly shuddered as he took a labored breath, perhaps in response to her touch. It took her a moment to recover and consider her options. On one hand, she could call the Maya, and thus the police, and possibly get in trouble for breaking and entering. On the other hand, she could call the police and possibly save this person's life. She pulled her tablet out of her pocket, then remembered something and nearly snapped it in half when she involuntarily clenched her hands. Didn't Maya tell her not to do anything illegal? She decided to call the police directly instead, attempting to remember the short string of numbers from when Maya dialed the police. The man left out a soft moan as she swiped her tablet open and she began dialing. It was a few tense moments before someone picked up. New Haven Police Services, how may we assist you today? We are currently receiving a high volume of calls, so please bear in mind that assistance may come later than usual. Adopting a breathy, whispery tone, Ruby gave the dispatcher a fake name and told the dispatcher the street the butcher shop was on along with the details of the situation. The dispatcher immediately sounded alert, her voice changing in intensity. Thank you, ma'am. Our officers and an ambulance will arrive shortly. Please stay where you are so we can ask you a few quest. Ruby immediately hung up and tucked the tablet back into her pocket. She ripped two sizable chunks of meat off of the nearest rack of ribs, then dropped them into her paper bags before sprinting out of the room. She hopped the counter again, ripped the bolt back out of the door, then ran down the nearest alleyway. She came out on the other side of the alley, fortunately in a place she recognized. Slowing her pace, she attempted to casually hold her two bags of stolen goods as she walked down the road. The snow was still falling quickly, ice and flurry settling on her hair even as she brushed it off. The dim morning light guided Ruby as she made her way to the noodle shop that catered to herbivores. That entire area was filled with shops that sold mostly vegetarian food product and vegetables. She doubted any of them would be open, but it wouldn't hurt to try. Besides, she could always break in and leave the money at the counter. A little past the noodle restaurant was a grocery store that was not too unlike the stores back in Vail. The door at the front was locked, but Ruby once again broke off the doorknob and forced her way through the bolt. There was a little bit of noise as she opened the door, but it was otherwise mostly silent. The grocery store was not too large, but it was still large enough to have a wide variety of produce to sell. Each of the shelves had a small misting device that seemed to periodically spray the leafy produce so constant maintenance wouldn't be required. Ruby wasn't really sure what Maya liked, so she just grabbed three grocery bags from the stand near the front door and began filling them with vegetables that she knew tasted okay. Ruby was almost done filling up her third bag when the sound of slippers against wood emanated from a door in the back of the store. She quickly dropped her bags and began pulling lean out of her pockets, counting out the price listed on the shelves as the person hurried down the stairs. She had taken the lean from her pockets and was holding it out as a peace offering when someone burst from the back doors holding a shotgun that was aimed at Ruby's face. The stranger wore a turtleneck sweater and woolen leggings, her hair pulled back into a ponytail. She had gleaming black feathers in her hair, light brown skin, and was now staring at Ruby, teeth bared. You think you can rob my store just because you're a snake? Ruby blinked. Ah, uh, air, no. Wait, yes. The woman snarled. Don't play dumb with me. She waved the shotgun menacingly. You know, ravens kill and eat snakes all the time. I don't think anyone would doubt me if I told them I killed you in self-defense. Ruby looked at her doubtfully. Okay, I'm just going to leave now, all right. I'll leave the money here in. The raven Faunus looked past her and frowned. You broke my door, she said accusingly. Did you leave enough money to cover that? Ruby hastily pulled some more lean out of her pocket. Is this enough? Are you stupid or something? Doors aren't cheap, especially not here in New Haven. The woman thought for a moment. All right, don't move an inch. I'm going to call the police and we're going to get this settled out. I would really appreciate if you didn't call the police, Ruby pleaded. The woman scoffed as she slowly circled Ruby at a distance, heading for her counter. You'll get everything that's coming to you, thief, she spat. Ruby slowly set the bags down, careful not to damage the items inside. 
An explosion of rose petals later, she was standing right behind the raven faunus, one hand gripping the faunus's slender neck and the other ripping the shotgun out of her hand. Please don't call the police, Ruby repeated, the faunus choking due to the sudden lack of air. Just forget I was here and... In a sudden whipping motion, the faunus grabbed the shotgun back while simultaneously elbowing Ruby in the head, disorienting Ruby despite her aura and making her head snap back. The surprisingly strong and agile bird faunus took the opportunity to force her way out of Ruby's grip, leaving a bit of her skin behind as she tore her way free. In a single fluid motion, she turned around and pressed the shotgun against Ruby's chest before firing. The pellet slammed into Ruby's chest and made her grunt, knocking her back a step. The faunus's eyes widened just the slightest as the metal beads clattered to the floor, but she didn't hesitate in pulling back the slide to fire off another round. Ruby attempted to sweep to the gun off to the side, but the faunus had already backed away out of her reach. The raven fired again, the bullets managing to rip holes in Ruby's shirt as she was pushed back, her aura beginning to fade. Ruby dashed behind the faunus in a shower of rose petals, but the when she arrived the raven already had the shotgun shoved up against her chest. A wisp of dull black aura swirled around the opening of the shotgun. Predictable, the faunus said, smirking as she pulled the trigger. The dust-infused pellets sunk into Ruby's chest as they flung her backwards and into a shelf of vegetables, the leafy greens crunching underneath her as they cushioned her fall. Despite being disoriented by the roar of the blast and the force of the bullets, she still had the sense to drop to the tiled floor and mostly dodge the next shot, some pellets ripping the fabric of her sleeve. Ruby found herself within arm's length of her bags of groceries. She scooped them up in an instant and dashed to the door, a trail of rose petals drifting behind her as she tumbled outside into the snow and made her escape. An outraged cry came from the shop as Ruby stumbled into the nearest alley and began moving forward, the thick snow slowing her progress down considerably. Ruby clutched the five bags of groceries to her chest, ignoring the blood that was staining them, and began running horizontally on the walls to the sides of the alley, pushing herself off of the walls to build speed as she approached the dead end of the alley. The moment she reached the brick wall, she jumped and slammed her boots against it, transferring her moment to run up the vertical surface. The sound of gunfire and a spread of bullets cracked the wall where she had just been as she ran up the wall. Ruby cleared the roof with a few extra feet to spare, briefly soaring through the air, then landed on both feet and continued running. After a few seconds, she glanced back and saw the bird faunus hauling herself over the roof and glaring at her, the shotgun holstered on her back. I left all my money in your store. Ruby shouted as she ran across the roof. It's not enough. The faunus shouted back. Ruby reached the edge of the roof and leapt to the next building. The raven faunus did the same, but her jump carried her much further than Ruby's jump, almost as if she were flying. She landed only a few feet away from Ruby, the roof shingles shattering underneath her feet despite her graceful landing, then whipped out her shotgun and took aim once more. Attempting to do something unexpected, Ruby dropped to her stomach and slid over the edge of the roof, letting go of the shopping bags as she dragged her body and hands against the side of the building to slow her fall before landing in the snow. The bags had luckily landed upright, most of the groceries still inside. Ruby grabbed them with her bloody fingers and ran down the alley. The raven landed in the snow behind her, ready to fire, but Ruby had already turned a corner and left her field of vision. Ruby was panting at this point, desperately covering her mouth as she attempted to muffle herself. She was already injured and nearly out of aura, so she realized that she had to turn back and fight now, or else she'd eventually be shot in the back. Thus, when the raven faunus came around the corner, Ruby was prepared, her fist slamming like a hammer into the raven faunus's midsection and her legs then swiping the faunus's feet out from under her. The black-haired woman let out a surprised gasp before thudding into the wall face first with a crunching noise, blood spurting from her nose as she fell onto her back in the snow, gasping and dazed. Ruby kicked the faunus in the side to flip her over, the raven's weak aura flickering out to the sound of snapping ribs. She then stood there for a moment, the faunus's heaving body that was racked with coughs inducing visions of bloodlust in her head. She knelt down and gripped the raven's jaw, wrenching the faunus's neck awkwardly to the side as she gazed into the injured faunus's furious liquid black eyes. Ruby gently brushed a few strands of black hair from the raven's cheek. 
The Farnas responded by spitting blood into her face as she spat curses. Ruby blinked and settled back. Sorry, Ruby said apologetically, wiping the saliva and blood off of her face. I'll come back around with the rest of the money next time, promise. How much was it again? The raven tried to say something but only ended up coughing again, a rattling noise emanating from her chest as she turned her head to the side and dribbled blood onto the snow. Ah, I didn't quite catch that. Quote ellipsis quote. Ruby leaned in closer. What? Fuck, you, the raven wheezed, weakly reaching for her shotgun. Ruby pulled the shotgun out of the holster before the faunus could grab it, then, as an afterthought, stripped the faunus of her holster too. Oh, uh, give this back to you with the money, Ruby promised. I just don't really feel like being shot again. The raven glanced at Ruby's chest wounds and shook her head. Freak, she muttered while coughing. Ruby strapped the holster to herself and tightened it. Well I'm going to go now, she said. You need a lift back. The raven stared at her, eyes squinted. What? Do you need a ride back? Ruby repeatedly slowly. I can carry you. Is this some sort of trick? The faunus coughed. I get it, you got me already, you don't need to gloat anymore. Ruby watched as the snow piled onto the raven's body. The faunus had one hand covering her nose as she stared into the sky, lightly coughing, blood trickling out from beneath her fingers. Another arm was wrapped around her midsection as she began to lightly shiver. If you die, I can't pay you back, Ruby said helpfully. Unless you can call someone for help right now. Tablets back in the shop, the faunus simply said. Ruby shifted a little on her feet and glanced at her groceries. Well, um, I should really get going soon. Are you sure you don't need any help? The raven attempted to sit up, but immediately collapsed in pain, taking shallow breaths as she held her side. Ah, fuck it, the raven groaned. You got me good. I think you broke my ribs. Sure, whatever, take me back. Let's just get this over with. Ruby slipped the handles of the bags over her arms, then crouched to pick up the faunus, cradling her in Ruby's arms. Oh god, this is embarrassing, the raven faunus moaned. I hate you so much right now. Don't try anything funny, Ruby warned her. The faunus only coughed in response. Ruby brightened up a little as they began walking. Nice to meet you, by the way. I'm Rose. What's your name? Roxy. That's a nice name. Do you live by yourself in your store? Your store is nice, by the way. Sorry about the door. Roxy sighed, staring into the sky in an attempt to distract herself. Hopefully she won't kill me before we get back. Chapter 59, Story Time. Roxy hadn't been happy about the whole situation, but she had cheered up a bit when Ruby had decided to return the shotgun when she got back to the shop instead of keeping it until she paid Roxy back. Besides, Ruby wouldn't have been able to keep it without Maya asking her questions. It had taken the rest of the day, but Ruby had somehow managed to find a shop selling whetstones and mineral oil. She had been wary about breaking in and getting shot, but she managed to liberate the items without incident and left a note saying that she'd taken a few things and would pay the shopkeeper back as soon as possible. After getting home, Ruby made a quick trip up the side of the walls to see if any Grimm were near the city. Seeing that things seemed to be alright for now, she covered her footprints and made her way down, heading home to change. The bloody and torn clothes were buried in the ground, underneath the snow. Ruby hoped that Maya wouldn't notice if a few clothes went missing. Most of them were nearly the same, anyways, with a few dull color variations. Ruby had finished sharpening her scythe and was wiping it down with a scrap of fabric when Maya returned. The rabbit faunus had a frustrated look on her face, and Ruby noticed that she had blood on her gloves. Maya flopped onto the couch with her satchel on her knees, resting her forearms on top of it. Ruby wondered what was wrong. Did Maya find out about her break-ins? Or was it just a normal day of work? Maybe it had to do with the increased crime rate that she mentioned, or the whole issue with the predators and herbivores. Maya answered the question for her. We found a butcher, a bear faunus, hanging on meat hooks in the back of his own shop. He was almost dead, mostly from blood loss, but we got him to a hospital in time. He's currently in critical condition, and they're looking for blood donors, but he's tough and we're hopeful that he'll pull through and be able to answer some of our questions. 
Ruby made surprised expressions and nodded at the appropriate moments. Want to see the pictures? Maya asked, pulling out her tablet. You might recognize him as the owner of the meat shop we stopped by a few days ago. Ruby nodded again and took the tablet, scrolling through the images. Wow, that's, um, unlucky. For him, I mean. That was just the first case that was reported today, Maya said, sighing. We have reports of more incidents of violence from all over New Haven. Ruby could only nod and hand the tablet back. I'm pretty sure it's retaliation against the predator attacks that have also been happening recently, Maya said. Remember the people who attacked you before? The two who came after you in the bar? The ones you shot, right? Yeah, I remember them. Do you think that there's more of those herbivores attacking people around town? Yeah, it's probably them. Maya shifted a little on the couch to a more comfortable position. Ah, saying herbivore and predator out loud sounds so ridiculous, but there's really no better description. Is there anything I can do to help? Ruby asked, putting away the scrap of cloth. Soon, Maya said, determined. I'm still gathering evidence and witnesses, but once I can convince all of the city guards to help, I can get rid of this corrupt police department. You can help by playing along with Emmett and remembering the locations of the places he raids and the locations of the safe houses that they're using. Got it, Ruby said, collapsing her weapon and setting it down next to herself. Groceries in the fridge, Maya asked. Ruby nodded. It took me a while to realize that I had to put the dust container in to power it. Ah, right. Most residences in the outskirts of New Haven aren't connected to the electrical grid. And not many buildings have refrigerators either, I suppose. Maya put her tablet away and leaned back into the couch for a moment, stretching. Ruby thought she looked as stunning as usual, her blue hair and athletic figure accentuated by the semi-tight uniform. So when Maya began loosening the belt around her waist, Ruby quickly picked up her weapon and focused intently on it, wiping a bit of drool off the corner of her mouth. My precious side is very shiny, Ruby told herself. The rabbit fawn is taking off her clothes next to me is not important, and this urge to eat her just simply means I'm hungry, is all. Ruby's stomach growled. She froze, her hands clenching the weapon tightly. Yes you're hungry, huh? Maya noticed, shaking her hair loose and combing it out with her fingers. I'll go make some food. You're welcome to cook the meat by yourself. Ruby sighed internally, relieved. How else would Maya have interpreted her hunger? She was simply being foolish again. By the way, did you spend all of the money? Ruby nearly dropped her weapon. I, ah, uh, funny story, Ruby stalled, thinking quickly. I might have broken something in one of the shops, and the store owner got mad at me, so I left them the money I had left and I promise you I'll go to work and earn back the money please don't be mad at me. By the end of her sentence Ruby had ran out of air and was clutching Maya's waist, kneeling on the ground as she pleaded, her face buried into Maya's stomach. Maya attempted to hide her smile but failed, the edges of lips curling upwards as she looked down at Ruby. Oh come on, what did you break this time? Ruby looked up at Maya, her lips pouting. A uh, door. Maya rolled her eyes, then chuckled as she pulled Ruby to her feet. Don't apologize to me, just do your job and make sure you pay for the damages. Ruby sighed in relief and hugged Maya, the faunus's blue hair caressing her face as Ruby breathed in her scent. Sorry, Ruby murmured. It's okay, Maya assured her, her face tinged slightly pink. Alright, let's make some dinner. Similarly to the refrigerator, the stovetop in the new house was also able to be powered with dust. Maya had to pull the tube of dust out of the refrigerator and use it to temporarily power the stovetop so the two could cook. The two discussed the day over dinner, with Ruby explaining her purchases and Maya talking about what she was doing to gather evidence against the predators. The crimes against the predators were new factors to consider, but in the end Maya had decided to stop Emmett and more importantly, the corrupt sheriff, first. Ruby felt a sense of comfort as they settled in for the night. She might even get used to this type of lifestyle, this routine. As long as nothing happened to the beautiful, blue-haired rabbit faunus in front of her, she would enjoy Maya as long as possible. Ruby spent most of the night staring at Maya's flawless backside. The blizzard had finally begun dying down. 
Before the sun could fully rise, Ruby got out of bed, wide awake, and put on her ragged, tattered clothes, wrapping herself in steel silk ribbons to make herself presentable and switching out the bandages around her face with the material. She clipped the dirty, bloody cloak onto the remnants of her combat skirt, strapped crescent rose to her belt, then rummaged through Maya's bag for a pen and a scrap of paper. After leaving a note, Ruby left the house through the shutters in the kitchen, reasoning that they would make less noise than the front door creaking open and shut. It wasn't as though Ruby didn't want to live with Maya anymore. No, Ruby had left because she had realized that with the blizzard ending, Vincent would be sending out hunting and gathering parties to collect supplies. Perhaps he might ask for Ruby to come again, considering how the weather conditions might impede their progress and hinder their detection of any hostile grim. In fact, now that Ruby thought more about it, it was nearly a certainty that he'd check on her after the blizzard. And Ruby wasn't stupid. She realized that Vincent was probably using the opportunity to keep an eye on her. After all, he did ask her about her past, something that Ruby herself didn't want to think about. It took longer than usual, but after referring to the map on her tablet and recognizing a few landmarks, Ruby made her way back to the campsite. The large clearing used to be filled with tree stumps poking their way out of the snow, but with the recent blizzard, there was only a sheet of pure white covering the entire area. Ruby had no clue where she had left the tarp, the structure having collapsed underneath the weight of the snow, and she couldn't make a campfire without the flint that was somewhere underneath the tarp, so she decided to make the best of her remaining hours by clearing out a bit of snow underneath the tree and taking a nap. Her cloak was meager protection, but the cold still wasn't bothering her, so she didn't mind. She woke up to a light tapping on her shoulder. It took her a moment to realize that she wasn't in Maya's house and that Vincent was towering over her, something akin to a worried expression on his face. I guess coming out here was the right decision after all. Tap, tap. Shaking off her lethargy, Ruby attempted to stand up. Her limbs felt numb, and she nearly fell face first into the snow, barely managing to catch herself on her hands and knees. It seemed that despite the cold not bothering her, sitting in the snow in the same position for a few hours would still adversely affect the movement of her limbs. Give me a second, Ruby muttered, feeling the strength return to her body. Vincent stood back, observing her as she slowly got up and stretched. It seems that you've ran into trouble during the past few days, he said, staring at the ribbons wrapping around her face and covering her eye. Ruby barely dared to breath as he examined her face. She had taken the intact contact out of her left eye, but she wasn't sure if Vincent would want to see what was under her bandages. I apologize for not sending any supplies due to the weather conditions, he continued, but you seem to be otherwise fine. Yup, I'm all good, Ruby agreed, letting out a relieved breath as she shook the snow off of her cloak. Are we going anywhere today? Vincent nodded, motioning for her to follow. We are gathering wood again. Our supplies of firewood have been depleted due to the recent snowstorm. Your task today is identical to your previous mission. Protect the woodcutters from any harm and prove yourself to be an ally to our city. I can do that, Ruby said, nodding. Maybe you'll eventually let me live in the city, too. Before I go crazy from, oh, say, not having any friends, or something like that. An amused rumble came from the lion faunus. I suspect you may already be damaged in the head. Ignoring Ruby's protests, he continued, but we shall see. Perhaps when the city is more, stable. Oh, yeah, um, that makes sense, Ruby quickly backtracked. No need to rush then, I guess. The pair walked onwards for some distance before meeting up with the group of Faunus milling about the gate of the city. They all wore the same items as last time, with white camouflage suits and various equipment either strapped to their backs or carried by two or more people. When they arrived at their destination, Ruby took position in a tall tree again, scouting the landscape and watching for threats. The Faunus worked tirelessly until noon, when everyone ate their food before returning to their jobs. Ruby was slowly growing bored, the white landscape gradually blinding her eyes, when the rustling of branches told her that someone else was coming up the tree. With sure foot placement and steady hands, Vincent gracefully pulled himself up next to Ruby and sat down, looking out at the landscape with her. Hi, Ruby chirped, perking up and immediately being grasped by the urge to ruffle his golden blonde hair that was streaked with black. 
Hello, Vincent responded, leaning back against the main trunk of the tree. I suppose that since you're applying to become a citizen of the city, I ought to get to know you better. Okai, Ruby said cautiously. What do you want to know about me? Hum, the lion hum. Why are you here? To help, Ruby answered automatically. Why do you feel a need to help? Ruby paused. Next question, please. Vincent shrugged at her answer and sat silently for a while. Would you like to hear an interesting story? I love stories, Ruby said, glad to have something that broke the awkward silence. Vincent glanced at her outfit. You know, amongst us faunas, we have a story about a little red riding hood. Oh, what's your story about? It's about the foolishness of humans and the oppression of our race. Simplified into a parable, of course. Is there a happy ending? Hey, what do you think? Yes. I won't spoil it, Vincent said with a smile. Ahem. Once upon a time, a young human girl walked down a path to her grandmother's cottage. She wore a red cloak and a red skirt and carried a basket filled with food on her arm. Her mother had given the young girl a blackberry pie and a bottle of cider to bring with her for her visit to her grandmother. Little Red set out in the morning, following a straightforward road to her destination. However, although she had been told to stay on the path and walk quickly, she had strayed to pick some flowers. And, unfortunately for the young girl, a pack of starving bea wolves were passing by, searching for food. Along the path there resided a small family of wolf faunus. They had always been friendly with their neighbors, and the nearby townspeople had learned to tolerate them. The youngest wolf faunus was out gathering berries when he happened upon Little Red. She was crying out in fear as she ran from the bea wolves, the savage creatures tearing at her and toying with her as she tried to escape. The young faunus fired at the bea wolves with his gun as he attempted to scare them off. His elder brother, hearing the commotion, came running out of the house and into the forest. The two of them managed to scare the starving bea wolves away, but at that point Little Red had already collapsed from fear and blood loss. The two of them carried her back to their home for treatment, binding her wounds to stop the bleeding and attempting to find out where she had came from. Her injuries were shallow, but she refused to wake up. As this all occurred, a townsperson who had also been using the path had witnessed part of the incident, the gunshots having attracted his attention. He had heard the sound of the guns firing, watched a wolf faunus run into the forest with a gun, and looked on helplessly as he saw two wolf faunuses carry a pretty, bloodied, and unconscious young girl back into their cottage. So of course, instead of calling a few friends for reinforcement and knocking on the door, he assumed the worst and spread the news to around his village, which formed a mob to storm the faunus's house. When the mother of the faunus opened the door they greeted her with a shotgun to the face. When the father came to help they shot him too. Then they ransacked the house and shot their two sons before dragging the injured human girl out of the house and setting it on fire. They had left the faunus for dead, but faunus are a hardy race. The two children nearly managed to escape despite their injuries, smashing the windows and jumping out of the building, only to be killed by the mob outside. In all the confusion, the daughter managed to escape through a hidden passage in the basement, fleeing in terror to the nearest Faunus village. News of the brutal slaughter spread quickly through the Faunus community. Meanwhile, the humans told each other that the wolf Faunus had captured, tortured, and eaten parts of Little Red, and the townspeople had merely administered justice. In fact, if the wolf Faunus were eating humans, wouldn't that mean that all Faunuses were capable of such deeds? If so, perhaps it might not have been a good idea to allow the Faunus to live alongside themselves after all. Vincent stopped. Ruby had been listening intently, an eager expression on her face as she waited for him to resume his story. So what happened? She blurted out. Did they clear up their misunderstanding? The Faunus war happened. Oh, what happened to Little Red? The rescue was too stressful for her, and she died a day later from her injuries. That wasn't really a story. Or a parable. That is how the story is told on our side. I'm sure you humans have a similar story. The exact details have been lost to time, which is why we call it a story, and it teaches a valuable lesson, which is why we can also call it a parable. That makes sense, Ruby agreed. We have a story too. 
In ours, Little Red Riding Hood is eaten by a monstrous wolf Faunus, her grandma is also eaten by that wolf Faunus, and then a huntsman rescues the two by killing the wolf Faunus and cutting them out of the wolf Faunus's stomach. That sounds utterly ridiculous. Ruby shrugged. Hey, I didn't make up the story. Well, at least we have not eaten each other yet, Vincent commented, rising to his feet. We will be going back in a few hours, Red. See you then. Ruby froze, unsure of how to interpret his words. Vincent stepped off of the branch and into the air, a small puff of snow from below indicating his landing a few seconds later. With Vincent gone, Ruby went back to watching the landscape, her thoughts in turmoil. Chapter 60, The Dance. Blake sat on her bed, speaking softly into her tablet. Yes, that'd be great. Months. Why the wit it takes months to arrange a trip, oh. Okay, that makes sense. All right, okay. I understand, thank you. She closed the tablet and stretched, yawning. She had been arguing with her benefactor about how they were handling the outpost that their faction had taken over and whether or not more intervention was required. Blake was in favor of sending more resources and manpower in order to make sure the outpost would be able to survive and maybe even thrive, but her benefactor had argued that their actions might draw undue attention and that the Faunus in the outpost would be able to survive on their own. After all, their kind had managed to survive in the menagerie for all those years. In the end, Blake had to concede. She had no real power to make decisions, after all. All she had done was provide some information and the idea for the settlement. Everything else was left to the moderate Faunus faction who was willing to attempt her proposal. A knock came from the window. Blake looked up, narrowing her eyes. A monkey Faunus with spiky blonde hair poked his head into view, a grin on his face. Hey, can I come in? He asked, his voice slightly muffled as he waved. Blake sighed good-naturedly and opened the window, allowing Sun to backflip into the room before she closed it once more. We have a door for a reason, Blake frowned. People are going to wonder why you keep sneaking in. Nah, we'll be fine, Sun reassured her confidently. Besides, I have Neptune with me. He's cool, right? Blake rolled her eyes. No, that's even more suspicious. Wait, Neptune. At that moment Blake heard a scream from outside before the cracking of branches and a thump on the ground silenced the noise. I'm okay, someone moaned weakly from below. Faint voices could be heard from outside. Hey, can you move? Someone get him a medic. Blake and Sun both looked outside the window and stared at the prone Neptune on the ground next to the building. I think I locked him outside when I closed the window. Do you think he's hurt? Nah, he'll be fine. Sun pulled back from the window, grabbed a nearby chair, and flipped it around, sitting in it backwards facing towards her. So, what's up? Not much, Blake said. Some personal business I'm working on, but nothing to worry about. Sun raised an eyebrow, looking concerned. More crazy cult stuff. I thought you dropped them a while back, after the whole takeover and bombing incident and the thing with Weiss. Blake looked around, hissing through clenched teeth. Don't you even dare talk about that, she threatened, her eyes narrowed into slits. Not here, not where there might be people listening. Weiss and I have put that behind us, and I don't want you to ruin the friendship we have now. The monkey Faunus immediately backed off, raising his hands into the air in a pose of surrender. Whoa, okay, you don't have to get all mad at me. I was just wondering, is all. Sorry, Blake apologized, her bow drooping slightly. I shouldn't have yelled. Thanks for talking with me and listening to my story back then. Sun grinned, holding out a fist. No problem. We Faunus gotta stick together, right? Right, Blake agreed, smiling as she lightly tapped his fist with her own. That reminds me, Sun suddenly said. I've been hearing things about Ruby, you know, the black and red haired girl I met at the docks with you guys, who had that huge side. Yes, I know her, Blake responded, her expression growing dark. She was a teammate, was. Sun faltered a little but pressed on. Are the stories true? I mean, things get exaggerated, right? He laughed nervously. Eating people, killing Faunus, going into hiding, getting sent to some prison camp in the middle of nowhere. All true, Blake growled. Oh, wow. Didn't really expect her to, you know. They sat in silence for a few awkward seconds. 
So, that grim attack, Sun quickly said, eager to change the topic. That was something, wasn't it? Heard Beacon took a lot of damage during whatever that attack was. Blake nodded, looking at the window. They had only recently gotten it repaired after it had been smashed during the grim attack. It had taken so long to repair due to the more pressing concerns around the school, where a number of buildings had either collapsed or were rendered unstable due to the huge amount of Nevermore feathers embedded in their walls. Yes, considering that we were selected to host the vital festival during that time, the attack really set things back. A lot of school events were delayed, actually, due to the number of casualties we suffered. Sounds like a bad situation, Sun said, nodding. So that's why the school dance was delayed until now, huh? Ahem, Blake murmured. Sun scratched his head awkwardly. So, ah, uh, you going with anyone? To the school dance, I mean. Kinda lame, if you ask me, but, ah, uh, you, me, not so lame. Blake looked at him, confused. What? He coughed. I mean, do you want to go to the dance with me? Sorry, but I'm spoken for, Blake said gently. That's fine, he said quickly. I mean, I can just go with a friend. Not like it's really formal or anything. Nora poked her head into the room. Yang and Blake are together together, she chirped. Nora. Blake cried. Have some tact. Ooh, Sun said, grinning. I should have seen that coming. You two do seem like the perfect match. Sun. Blake shouted, her cheeks now tinged with pink. I mean, ah, do you really think so? Yup. He laughed. Nora giggled to herself, then shut the door and skipped away. Smiles on their faces, their conversation topics shifted toward more happy memories as they chatted. Team JNPR and us are in charge of the planning. Yang asked incredulously. Hell yeah. Seems like you're pretty excited, Blake commented, setting her book down. Of course I am, Yang exclaimed, toweling herself off. I'll get a real DJ, a dance floor, a nice sound system, some pyrotechnics, and then sneak some alcohol inside. Alcohol. Yeah, I'll spike the punch. It'll be great. Young snickered to herself. I can't wait to see what Team JNPR are like when they're drunk. Young, I don't know if that's really a good idea. Nonsense, of course it is. I should know, I've been to plenty of clubs. Everyone looked like they were having fun at them. Blake rolled her eyes. If you want to imitate a club scene, you might as well bring all the illegal substances too. Yang paused, looking at her worriedly. Do you think that's needed? I'm not sure how much they're letting me spend on supplies, and drugs are pretty expensive. Yang, no. I was being sarcastic, Blake amended hastily. No drugs. Ah, oh, fine, Yang acquiesced, disappointed. Yang dropped her towel to the floor and began dressing. Her skin was still a little wet from the shower, the reflected light emphasizing her curves as she slowly slid her clothes on. After noticing that Blake was watching her with wide eyes as she pretended to read her book, Young wiggled her hips a little and smiled seductively. Blake's ears perked up even as she attempted to look away. Young laughed as she sauntered toward the cat faunus. Aren't you enjoying this a little too much? Considering how many times you've seen me naked already. Why Young? We don't have time for this, Blake whispered hurriedly, blushing. I told JNPR we'd meet them in the library to plan the, um. After a few seconds, Young pulled back and grinned, licking her lips. Well, I guess we'd better go. Don't want to keep them waiting, now do we? Ah, um, yeah, Blake breathed, lightheaded. The two headed toward the library. It was getting dark, the night air growing cool. The light coming from inside the library was bright and inviting as the two walked inside. Bookshelves surrounded them as they walked up the stairs, heading for an area deep within the library where few people ever went. The curved ceiling of the library was visible as they headed to the second floor. A familiar sight greeted them as they arrived. John was studying with Kira, while Nora was nodding off as Ren did his homework. The board game that was usually spread out onto Team RWDY's desk was absent, the box that contained the game now collecting dust where it rested upon a nearby shelf. Kira noticed them first, smiling and waving. Hello, she said cheerfully. I'm glad you could make it. Nora snorted and mumbled something in her sleep as Ren gave them an amicable nod. Is Weiss not coming? Did something happen? John asked apprehensively. Blake paused. 
Ah, it's been a while since we've talked like this, hasn't it? Weiss is off with Ali's on a super secret mission we can't really talk about, Young said as she took a seat at the table. I don't know if you guys know who Ali's is, but she and Weiss are basically married at this point, so they went on the mission together. Married? Gira asked, a little shocked. Blake nodded. It's true, they've been living together for quite a while now. You should really see how they act around each other. Gira murmured something to herself and glanced at John with a thoughtful expression on her face. John, as usual, didn't notice anything. Party. Nora shouted as she suddenly woke up. Hi Blake, hi Young. Hey Nora, how's it hanging? Our mission was a success, Nora answered exuberantly. Hey, did anyone mention that we bumped into Rub? Nora's voice was suddenly muffled as Ren cupped his hand over her mouth. What she means is that we bumped into someone called Ru, hurt during the mission, Ren interjected. You guys don't know him, so I'm not sure why Nora was bringing him up. Reet, Ru Perk, John nodded, agreeing. Yup, funny guy, ha ha, he said as he laughed nervously. Kira clapped her hands together. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about this dance that we have to plan. Blake narrowed her eyes a little but chose to overlook their little slip up. Yang's happy expression slipped a little but she also chose to ignore them, pretending to remain ignorant as she nodded and agreed with Kira. Yang took the initiative. First things first, do we have enough money for alcohol? I mean, it's a party, right? Multiple groans could be heard across the table as Blake grabbed Yang's shoulders and shook her. No. Bad Yang. No alcohol, no drugs, no strippers. Strippers. Forget I said that. After they had argued down Yang's suggestions, they managed to accomplish something with their limited funds. A dance floor, some strobe lights, a few balloons, and catering had been secured, all at a reasonable cost. They had gotten a few students to help create some streamers and banners to drape along the ceilings, complementing the colors of the balloons they had distributed throughout the room. The end result was a mixture of a formal dance with a bit of playfulness injected into it, the color scheme of pink and blue indicating that this was a dance meant to be taken not too seriously, a dance to have fun at and enjoy before their real missions began. The dance, at first, was a success. Young, you look fantastic. Nora bubbled as she greeted Yang at the door. It, somehow suits you, Ren commented. Ah, thanks. Yang did a little twirl. I kind of went with a classic, you know. Well, come on in and welcome to the party. Nora grinned at her and clutched Ren's arm, then dragged him past the desk and toward the crowd of people in the ballroom. John was right behind her, looking a little sheepish in his tuxedo. Yang looked at him, blinking. Hey, where's Pira? John hesitated. Pira, I, I didn't ask her to the dance. I'm sure she had a bunch of guys lining up to take her to the dance, so I didn't really want to, you know, compete with them. Yang sighed. She reached out and patted John on his head, a pitying expression on her face. If you like someone, you're going to have to fight for them, she said, a little disappointed. John took a step back, putting himself out of reach. Be that. Yang saw something in the corner of her eye and glanced up. Hey John, now's your chance. Wah. Yang leaned over and picked John up by the collar, then heaved him up into the air and over the second floor railing. He landed with a grunt as he absorbed the impact with a roll and leapt upright. Hey, what was that for? He shouted indignantly down to Yang. Uh, John, Pira asked, touching his shoulder. He spun around, startled. Oh, hey, Pira. What are you doing up here? He looked around. Where's your partner? Partner? Kira asked, frowning. John, I came alone to the dance. John froze momentarily. Ah, oh, really? He choked out. Kira sighed and looked down at the floor, her arms folded. Yes, John. Not everyone has the courage to talk to, well, to put it frankly, someone like me. John opened his mouth as if he wanted to say something but closed it again, a nervous expression on his face as he backed off. Ah, okay, alright. Well, ah, uh, good luck with that, he mumbled. He turned around and promptly tripped on a chair, smashing into a table before sliding to the floor. Pira stalked over to him, her heels clicking on the floor as she hauled him up and set him upright. 
Look, John, maybe I've been too vague about this, so it's partially my fault. She took a deep breath. John, I like you, and I've liked you since the day we met. You treated me like a normal person and didn't put me onto a pedestal like all the others did, even after you found out about who I was. John's shocked expression transitioned into an uncertain smile as he listened to her words. So, Pira prompted. John took a similarly deep breath before speaking. Pira, I like you too, and I've always admired you for your strength and your intelligence. I'd be really happy if you'd come to this dance with me. I I mean, we're already at this dance, but... Shish, Pira whispered, putting a finger over his lips. Yes, I'd love to dance with you. Hand in hand, they walked toward the stairs and descended to the dance floor. Well, I think that's almost everyone, Yang said, closing her tablet. Then will you accompany me to the dance floor? Blake proposed, proffering her gloved hand. The cat Faunus was dressed in a sleek black suit, the edges of her lapels trimmed with purple. Her hair was slicked back, and a bow at her neck complemented the bow in her hair. Of course, Yang grinned, clasping her hand and pulling her in. Have I mentioned how sexy you look in that suit? Ah, oh, really? Blake stammered, her cheeks tinged with pink. This is just my old uniform, I didn't know if it'd still look good. Thank you. The couple stepped out from behind the desk and turned to head toward the dance floor. At that moment, a familiar voice suddenly came from behind them. Hello, the voice said hesitantly. The blonde and raven-haired girl spun around in shock, their eyes widening as they realized who they were looking at. She was wearing a long white coat decorated with shni insignias, a skirt that extended to her knees, and a pair of heeled boots. Weiss. Hey Yang, Blake, Weiss answered. I haven't you two in quite a while. They let you leave, Blake asked. Leave, Weiss laughed, her voice a little bitter. As if, I'm on a leash, and I'm chained to Ali's. They know I won't do anything stupid while Ali's is in their custody, under their treatment. Blake filed the odd emphasis on the word away in her mind. But you're here for now. Yang said eagerly. How long are they letting you go for? Weiss shrugged. This is a sort of special event, and Ali's is busy right now, so I can stay for tonight and I'll be gone tomorrow morning. I just wanted to meet up with you two and tell you that everything is going okay. How have things been with just you two as a team? That's good to hear, Yang said happily. I think we've been managing pretty well as a two-person team. Blake nodded in agreement. Really? Then you're definitely going to have to tell me all about it. Weiss inclined her head toward the tables. Come on, let's grab some seats. You two can catch me up on everything that's been going on in the past few months. The night progressed smoothly onwards. Chapter 61, The Dance PT2 Really? Weiss asked incredulously, laughing. You actually threw him at Pira. Yup. And look, everything worked out. She pointed toward the happy couple on the dance floor. Seems like they're having a great time. Blake took a sip of water. So what have you been doing? She asked. Ali seems preoccupied with whatever program she's participating in, but so far you haven't said anything about yourself. Weiss looked at her hesitantly. Do you really want to know? Let's just enjoy this night, relax, talk with some friends. Now you've really made me curious, Yang said. Come on, you can't just say that and not tell us. Blake looked at Weiss, an eyebrow raised. Did you really think we'd say no after hearing that? Weiss sighed. Of course not. She cleared her throat and shifted a little in her seat. Well, I've been doing some research. Research about the things they're doing to Ali's that they won't fully reveal even to me. Research about the odd grim attack a few months ago, and research about what happened to her. There was a moment of shocked silence. Yang leaned forward. What do you mean, what happened? I really shouldn't have said anything, Weiss groaned. Look, I don't have anything conclusive, but do you really think that she would just do those things out of the blue? After all the years that you knew her and lived with her. What changed her? What made her become what she is now? Young looked a little pale as she slumped back into her chair, her hand gripping Blake's hand, her knuckles turning white. Weiss, Blake growled, her eyes narrowing. I'm sorry, I've said too much, Weiss apologized, quickly backtracking. Look, let's just... An agonized howl interrupted her. 
Blake and Yang scrambled out of their seats and scanned their surroundings while Wei slipped her hand into her pocket. People began to scream, the students milling about the dance floor as they rushed to get away from something. A strange, stiffly enunciated voice cut through the noise. Oh dear, why is this human so fragile? A few minutes ago, Penny had been dancing on the ballroom floor, alone. Her being alone wasn't unusual, of course. Her father had always been rather protective of her, so her contact with other people had been limited to her personal guards and the scientists who constantly maintained and upgraded her. But, after looking around at everyone else, she decided that she would at least try to interact with others. After the disappearance of her friend, it might be time to make a new one. She didn't have much hope that she would find someone as nice as Ruby, but maybe this way she'd be a little less lonely. She turned to the red and blue uniformed guards behind her. I would like to dance with a partner. They looked at each other. The blue one cleared his throat in the awkward silence. That wouldn't be a good idea, Penny. Why? We're under strict orders not to allow you to interact with anyone past the point of verbal communication, the red one said. Penny tilted her head. Oh, yes, I remember now. Penny wanted to tell them that she'd been in contact with people before, that she had hugged Ruby and everything had been fine. But she understood that it would only bring further trouble upon herself, especially if what she had heard about Ruby was true. Her father had tried his best to keep information about such things secret from her, but she still heard whispers and rumors from other people. Penny didn't know why Ruby would do those things, but she was sure that Ruby had a good reason and that Ruby would explain everything once she was back. After all, even though she had been gone for a while, Ruby was still her friend. Then I will go find people to talk with, if that is okay with you too. They nodded. Talking is fine, Penny. Permission given, she walked back onto the dance floor and tried to approach the nearest group. But they took one glance and drifted away from her, avoiding eye contact. Recognizing that they didn't want to speak to her, Penny moved on to the next group, hoping that she would have better luck with them. But they all had a similar response to her advances, a small bubble forming around Penny as she walked through the crowd. Her robotic movements and the impression she had given when she spoke disturbed most people enough to make them to unconsciously avoid her. The guards flanking her and staring people down with their faceless visors didn't help either. She stopped at the punch table, feeling a sinking sensation where her synthetic heart lay. No one likes me, she decided. I am not making friends by staying here. I wish Ruby were here. Should I leave? Is that impolite? A small beeping sound caught her attention, making her turn around suddenly, her head tilting as she located the source of the noise. The people around her involuntarily flinched at her abrupt movement. Penny ignored them and looked toward her two bodyguards, both of whom were in the process of pulling out their tablets and reading the notifications that had appeared on them. What's wrong? She asked. The two guards looked at each other hesitantly. The blue guard spoke up. It seems that there's an emergency, Penny. We need leave now. Can I trust you to find Ironwood and stay by his side? Not a problem, Penny replied enthusiastically. Leave it to me. I'll protect Mr. Ironwood. They looked at each other and shrugged. Then go, the red one said. We'll be back as soon as possible. After glancing back at Penny, the pair immediately ran toward the entrance. Penny waved until they disappeared from her sight, then turned around to find Ironwood. She saw him off on the other side of the room, a tablet in his hand as he spoke orders into it. She began walking toward him, only to be obstructed by two of her fellow students. Hi, the green-haired one said. I'm Emerald. I'm Penny, the synthetic being automatically replied. It's a pleasure to meet you. I noticed that you've been alone all night, Emerald said. Why is that? The order she had been given momentarily warred with the desire to finally talk to someone. I'm not supposed to be in physical contact with anyone, Penny responded after a moment. My father said so. Emerald made a sympathetic face. That doesn't sound too fair. Did he say why? Penny shook her head. No, and no one seems to like me either. I don't have any friends here. There, there, Emerald said soothingly, patting her shoulder. I'll be your friend. I don't mind if you touch me. Really? Penny gasped, grasping Emerald by the shoulders. You'll be my friend. 
Emerald gave her a strained smile as she gritted her teeth, the bones in her shoulders making creaking and grinding noises. Mercury chuckled softly behind her. Yes, Penny, you're my friend now. Sensational. Penny cried out, pulling Emerald into a full-bodied hug. Emerald let out an involuntary moan of pain as her ribcage cracked. She bit down on her tongue as Penny tightened the hug, a small glow of green aura flaring around Emerald for a moment before fading. A sheen of sweat was visible on Emerald's face when Penny finally pulled away, but Emerald still maintained her smile. You want to learn a secret method for making friends? A secret method? I sure do. Just give someone the same hug you just gave me, Emerald told her. It's a surefire way to get someone to like you. Penny nodded to herself. That makes sense, she agreed. She should have realized it earlier. She had hugged Ruby when they became friends, and after that she hadn't had the opportunity to hug anyone else. Did that mean father didn't want her to be friends with anyone? Thank you so much for the advice, Penny said to her. I'm going to go hug someone right now. Yeah, you go do that. Emerald watched as Penny ran off into the crowd of people, looking for someone to hug. Hey Mercury, pop my shoulders back in. Mercury raised his eyebrows. What? That dunce dislocated my shoulders, she hissed. Pop them back into place before someone sees that my shoulders aren't aligned and I haven't moved my arms for the past minute. Wow, Mercury said, whistling appreciatively as he mercilessly wrenched on her shoulders. This'll be good. Emerald wobbled a little from the pain, forcing her to lean on Mercury until she could stand on her own. The two of them watched as Penny finally selected her victim, the android cornering the unfortunate boy and picking him up with a manic grin on her face. Penny noticed that things weren't going as expected when the person she was hugging began screaming in pain. She immediately set him back down onto the ground where he collapsed into a heap at her feet, his limbs flailing as he attempted to scoot away from her. His arms were broken and bent backwards, his chest area deformed. Penny took a step back, her face creased with worry, but she was still caught in the spray of blood as the boy coughed onto her, his lungs perforated by his broken ribs. His screams turned into gurgles as he choked, his expression a rictus of pain as his eyes begged for mercy. People began to scream, and others began to shout for paramedics. Oh dear, Penny said worriedly, realizing something was wrong. Why is this human so fragile? She had hugged Ruby without a problem, and Emerald didn't have any problems with her hug. Why had this person snapped so easily? I think he's leaking, she commented to no one in particular. A wide circle had been formed around her and the bleeding boy on the ground. Some of the students were running toward the exits, while the others surrounded Penny with scared but determined expressions on their faces. Get away from him. A boy with blonde hair and blue eyes shouted at her. Penny nodded and stepped away from the puddle of blood staining her shoes. The people who had stayed behind immediately moved to form a barrier between her and the boy on the ground. I'm sorry, I think I did something wrong, Penny apologized. Yeah you did, a faunus girl with a bow covering her ears said. What just happened, Penny? You um, Penny stammered. I just wanted to hug someone and make friends with them. Crushing someone's ribs and possibly killing them is not how you make friends, the nearby blonde said disbelievingly. That wasn't a hug, that was attempted murder. I only hugged him, Penny insisted. I didn't know that he would break so easily. Don't you know your own strength? Weiss asked. I hugged Ruby, Blake growled, and she didn't break, Penny reasoned. Weiss nodded to herself upon hearing Penny's statement. Yang opened her mouth to say something, but a purple glow surrounded Penny before they could respond. Penny struggled a little before realizing what was happening, then slumped, her chin resting on her chest as she stared downwards. Linda Goodwitch pushed through the crowd, her riding crop glowing in her hand. She paused for a moment to look at Penny with an unreadable expression before turning to the crowd and speaking. Settle down, everyone, Linda said sternly, a scowl on her face. You three, you seem to know this girl. Come with me. All students not involved with keeping the boy alive need to leave. Now. The crowd began to disperse, the sound of quiet conversation building as students streamed through the main doors. By the time the paramedics arrived, the only people remaining were a few of the victim's friends that stubbornly remained by his side. 
Young half-heartedly kicked around a few of the balloons on the floor as the trio watched the paramedics load the boy onto a stretcher. Linda observed the procedure impassively, only turning to the girls after the ambulance had left. Why is it that you three are always involved something or the other? Linda scowled. Come, you need to tell Ironwood what you saw. The girls followed Glinda obediently, Penny floating along in a purple haze with them, as she quickly led them through a series of doors and down a short hallway. As they stepped into an office, they could hear someone shouting at the two red and blue uniformed guards. Matter what, you two were not supposed to leave her side. I don't care what kind of break-in was occurring, you should have stayed. Sir, our comrades were screaming for help, the red one pleaded. We thought she'd be more obedient, the blue one complained. Neither of you have any excuses for what you've done, Ironwood snarled. You idiots have ruined her future. He took a deep breath, attempting to calm himself. Reaching into his white overcoat, he pulled out his flask and took a swallow before recapping it. Linda chose that moment to announce her presence by clearing her throat. Resorting to alcohol to fix your problems, James. Ironwood spun around, an array of expressions dancing across his face before settling into despairing resignation. Linda, he said, acknowledging her. You two, leave us. We'll discuss this issue later. The pair of guards saluted the general before jogging off in the direction of the cross-continental transmit tower. Ironwood stared at Penny. He looked decades older, the streaks of gray in his hair more pronounced, his cheeks looking sunken and gaunt. Penny on the other hand looked mostly confused and a little uncomfortable as she floated a foot above the ground, her cream-colored dress now decorated with droplets of blood that were turning a darker shade of red as they dried. So, Linda inquired, finally breaking the silence. We have a limited amount of time before the authorities come to apprehend Penny. I'm really sorry about what happened, Penny offered. Aye aye. It's not your fault, you don't know your own strength, Ironwood interjected. I shouldn't have let you come here in the first place. My own ego blinded me to the possible risks of letting you interact with others. Linda looked at the girls. Do you three believe she did this out of malice? A bit of fire entered Ironwoody's eyes as he glared at her. I know she didn't. I asked for their opinions, not yours, Linda snapped. Penny knows the names of these girls, so I presume that they've spoken to her before. What do you three think? I I don't know, Yang admitted. We met her a while back in the city, where she helped us out with some stuff. I don't think she's evil, but I haven't talked to her that much. It's the same thing with me, Weiss agreed. I don't think she's a bad person. Maybe a little lonely or crazy, but not evil, Blake added. Ironwood sighed, his eyes closing for a moment. Thank you, he murmured. Glinda released Penny, keeping a careful eye on the android even as she gently set her onto the ground. Then I'll leave the decision up to you, James. Just remember that anything that occurs is in your head, not mine. What are you planning on doing? Ironwood's face hardened. I'm going to call in some favors, make some excuses, and get the police off our case. He turned to Penny. Whatever happens next, just know that I'm doing this all for you. This is the only way I'll be able to save you. Linda nodded to Ironwood and turned to the three girls. Your presence is no longer needed here. Thank you for your opinions. She looked at them intently. I trust you'll remain discreet about this discussion. Wait, what? Blake exclaimed. You're letting her get away with attempted murder. Ironwood ignored Blake and walked toward the exit, Penny walking next to him with a questioning expression on her face. This is wrong, Blake said, watching as the pair left the room. What's going on here? What aren't you telling us? Linda folded her arms, her eyebrows raised. I'd advise you to keep your nose in your own business, Ms. Belladonna. Young immediately clamped a hand over Blake's mouth before she could make a retort. I advise you three to return to your dorms for night, Linda continued. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have other matters to attend to. Her purple cloak fluttered behind her as she strode out of the room. The door swung shut. My own business. Blake exploded. Young squeezed her arm. Let it go, Blake. They must have a reason for doing this, and they clearly don't want to tell us anything. We just have to believe that what they're doing is for the greater good. I agree, Weiss said. We weren't going to get anywhere if we tried to argue with her. 
I still think this is messed up, Blake scowled. Killers need to face justice. She paused, taking a deep breath and running a hand through her hair before exhaling. But it seems like I'm not going to get any answers at the moment, so I might as well drop it. Good decision, Weiss agreed. Come on, let's go. Team JNPR was still there when we left, so let's see if there's anything we can help them out with. John was standing to the side, his hands stained with blood as he talked with his teammates. And I couldn't heal him, those injuries were way too severe. All I could do was try to keep him alive. Kira rested a hand on his shoulder. You did the best you could, John, and you were a lot more useful than the rest of us. You kept him alive long enough for the ambulance to arrive, Mora added. I think you did a pretty good job. Ren nodded sagely. I just wish I could have done more, John lamented. What would we have done if one of you got injured out on a mission, away from Beacon? Well, I guess I could keep you alive long enough to call a hoverjet, but still. Hey look, there's team. Mora paused. W, Ubi. Is that how you say? Ren covered Nora's mouth, a placid smile on his face nodded toward the remaining three members of Team RWBY. Hey guys, John greeted them. I can't believe Weiss's visit and this dance just got ruined by, whatever just happened. Actually, I'm still not sure what just happened. Who is that girl? Kira asked curiously. And why did she just crush that poor boy? It looked like she was, surprised when she hurt him. Weiss looked at Blake, and Blake looked at Yang. Yang sighed. Well, we sort of know that girl, Yang answered. Her name is Penny. We met her during the incident at the docks when Roman and the White Fang were trying to steal the dust shipments. You know her. Why didn't you tell anyone she was dangerous? Kira gasped, shocked. She hadn't hurt anyone at the time, Yang said, giving Blake a pointed look before the Faunus could say anything. She helped Blake, Sun, and R. Ruby, she stumbled over the name out at the docks, knocked out some White Fang members and brought down an airship that was trying to get away with some dust. So, she's an ally. A friend, I suppose. Do you know why she did this? Yang shrugged. It was apparently an accident. She couldn't control her own strength and she, just squished him, I guess. Blake interrupted her. What Yang just said was what, she lowered her voice, Linda and Ironwood told us. We can't trust them, not after they just let Penny go. Young looked around furtively. And for the record, we didn't know anything about this. If anyone asks, we thought they were taking Penny into custody. John stiffened. They let her go. Weiss shook her head. Not exactly. It seems like Ironwood's going to go pull a few strings and try to get the charges against Penny dismissed. But yes, he and Penny are evading the authorities at the moment. Yang cleared her throat. Anyways, she seemed like a sweet, nice girl when we first met. Blake can tell you more about her, I wasn't there at the docks when Penny fought. She's incredibly strong, Blake admitted. Strong enough to anchor herself to an airship and then to the ground before pulling the airship out of the sky. Nora squirmed out of Ren's grasp. Don't you think that means she might have actually not been able to control her own strength? Nora asked hopefully. Maybe, Blake said reluctantly. But there's a reason why courts and justice systems exist. If she really is innocent, she needs to be put to trial. But what if she's some sort of super soldier? Nora continued excitedly. Maybe she's in some sort of super duper secret project where they can't let people find out about her. Weiss shifted a little. Wait a minute, she was the person doing that awesome robot dance, right? John suddenly asked. I think she was alone for most of the night. I saw two guards following her around everywhere, and she never danced with anyone. Ren spoke up, startling most of the group. Perhaps the guards were preventing her from interacting with others, he said quietly. Or perhaps we are thinking too deeply about this, and they were merely there for her own safety. That's still a little weird, isn't it? Yang asked. Two guards in uniform and everything. Just for herself. Just who is she, anyways? Weiss questioned. The more we talk about her, the less I'm sure I even know anything about her. John looked at her. Wait, you never talked to her tonight. Wasn't she supposed to be your friend? She's not a friend, she only helped us at a convenient time, Blake argued. Maybe an ally, at the most. Wow, that's cold, Nora commented. Blake narrowed her eyes. 
But if she was alone, the three of you could have said hello, maybe asked her how she was doing, Kira said gently. Weiss grimaced as she unconsciously smoothed out her sleeves. Then I'm sorry, it was my fault. I was too busy catching up with my team. Kira looked startled. No, no, I didn't mean to place any blame, she said quickly, backtracking. I was just voicing my thoughts. I'm sure you're not the only ones who were here tonight who know her. Anyone could have talked to her. Anyone, huh? Weiss said speculatively. Did you guys remember how the guard said something about some sort of incident occurring? A break-in. Something so serious that people were dying and they had to leave Penny, Young grieved. An outside party influencing her. Could be a possibility, Blake agreed. Something to look into. I guess it's time to do some investigating, Nora said excitedly. Where should we start? Wait, Pira said cautiously. Before we dive into this situation, maybe we should tell Ozpin first and see what he says about this. I think he would just tell us that it's classified information, Blake said bitterly. It wouldn't hurt to ask, John said. Let's start from there. Weiss yawned. You guys can start tomorrow morning, she said tiredly, rubbing at her eyes. I need to leave in a few hours. I can't miss my flight. Yang nodded. Yeah, it's been a long night. Let's take some time to think about this and we can meet up tomorrow. You're right, John agreed reluctantly. We've got lots of new information to think about. Catch you guys later, then. Have a safe flight, Weiss. It was nice seeing you again, Weiss, Kira added. Hopefully we can sit down and chat under better circumstances the next time we see each other. Nora hopped onto Ren's back. Bye, Weiss. Say hi to Ali's for me. Come on Ren, let's go. Ren smiled and obliged her, waving to the rest of them before trotting off in the direction of their dorms. John and Kira soon followed, their arms linked as they walked away. Weiss stayed in their room that night, sleeping on the bed that Blake had kept neat and clean throughout her absence. It was a small gesture, but Weiss was especially touched. It almost made her feel guilty about the things she wasn't telling them. She left quietly the next morning, trying not to wake the other two. Despite her efforts, Weiss was sure Blake had heard her, judging by the twitching of her ears, but Young had remained asleep and was snuggling with the faunus. It was only after Weiss had left Beacon did Blake and Young realize that they had forgotten to continue their earlier conversation with her. For a few days, Yang's mind was filled with thoughts of Ruby, but she told Blake she was fine until she believed in herself. Chapter 62, Heading Forward This is some miserable weather we've been having lately, isn't it? Makes me wonder why I volunteered to be here in the first place. The young man with white feathers in his brown hair sighed as he picked up his mug and took a swallow. Not for the first time, he made a face and dropped the mug back onto the table, the liquid inside sloshing around a bit and a few drops spilling over the edge. Wish they had something stronger, he muttered. Or on guard duty, the auburn-haired woman responded, her rabbit ears twitching. And you volunteered because you had nowhere else to go. She placed a few playing cards onto the table, making the avian faunus throw his cards down and groan. The woman smirked and gathered them up again, rearranging them into a deck and shuffling. The man stood up and stretched his legs, then walked over to a nearby table that had a variety of foodstuffs on top of it. Lifting the lid off of one of the containers of food, he gave it a quick sniff before deeming it acceptable and grabbing a bowl and a fork. After filling the wooden container with salad, he sat back down at the table, waiting for the woman to finish dealing the cards. You know, he said, his mouth full of food, I find it insulting that you think I came here because it was my last resort. The rabbit faunus rolled her eyes. This wasn't the first time she'd heard this, and she was sure it wouldn't be the last. After all, he said, gesticulating with his fork before taking another bite, we're all here for the betterment of our kind. It would rude to think that any of us have ulterior motives. Aha, uh -huh. she motioned at his face down cards. Hurry up and put something down. He barely glanced at the cards before selecting two and placing them onto the table. The salad tastes better today. Glad they took my advice. She responded with a few more cards of her own. Maybe you should stop being so picky and bothering the poor cooks. He shrugged. It's not that big of a deal. I just asked them to change the ratio of the vinegar to the... 
A series of urgent knocks came from the entrance, interrupting whatever he was about to say. The two of them immediately sat upright, glancing at each other before both walking to the door. The woman grabbed the doorknob and opened it. Hi, the messenger girl standing outside said. The captain wanted me to tell you guys that something's happening at the main meeting building and wants one of you to come and weigh in on a decision. The avian faunus patted the rabbit faunus on the back. Have fun at the meeting. Tell them I said hi. She glared at him. Too troublesome for you, Roderick. Roderick nodded. I need to go finish my snack anyways. Can't let food go to waste, you know. Don't worry, I'll go keep Eric company up there. She frowned but nodded anyways. Then I'll be going now. Don't bother him too much. Roderick looked offended. Me, a bother. Why, I ought to. The auburn-haired faunus shut the door and turned to the girl with a strained smile. She began walking, the girl falling into step beside her as they trod through the fresh snow. What's going on? She asked. Isaac doesn't usually call a meeting for trivial matters. The messenger Faunus looked at her. Well, there's apparently a police officer at the main building that has some evidence or something. Isaac took a look through her files and immediately sent me to get you guys. A police officer. The other Faunus looked intrigued. I haven't heard good things about them. I wonder what they'd want us for. Maya watched the man across her sift through her pile of documents and photos, his face remaining impassive despite the not-so-sanitary contents of the thick bundle. She had gone to the central guard tower straight after her last shift had ended and asked to see the captain of the guards. Luckily, the man himself was easily accessible and willing to listen to whatever she had to say after she had handed the folder over. He had taken a single glance and immediately called a messenger to gather most of the wall guards for a meeting. As she sat in the surprisingly comfortable chair and waited for the other guards to arrive, she took a moment to reflect upon the home invasion, she supposed she could call it, that had occurred the two days ago. Now that a day had passed and she wasn't sleep deprived or freezing, she was able to collect her thoughts in a more organized manner. She had seemed calm at the time, although maybe she had been a little vicious, maybe a little too heavy handed in dealing with the prisoners. She had kept her calm facade to give Red someone stable to rely on during the violence and fire. But in all honesty, she had been angry. Angry, and more than a little scared. To think that she had been attacked in her own house, that if the attackers were a little smarter they could have just set the house on fire while she was sleeping, that no help would have come due to the snowstorm. So she had dealt with them harshly, maimed them, broken their limbs repeatedly, and a little part of her mind had been satisfied. Calm. That sort of behavior probably wasn't healthy, she reflected, but it was most likely due to an accumulation of stress and what she had been through and seen during her time here at New Haven. She snorted a little at the name. Some, Haven, it was turning out to be. Getting her mind back on track, ah, yes, Red. Maya had seen some of that kind of behavior in Red. A slip of tongue here or there, some extremely eccentric behavior, and a shocking propensity and even enthusiasm for violence. No, Maya wasn't dumb or deaf or willingly ignoring what was in front of her eyes. Red was dangerous, mentally unstable, probably had a criminal record, and entirely too obsessed with her. She had to admit though that she had, in a way, taken advantage of Red. From pressuring her to join Emmett's group and participate in their activities, to having her run errands, to using her as an interrogation tool, Maya knew that she hadn't been hesitant at all to put Red to work after she had realized just how much Red would do in return for a few kind words and some hugs. So while Red was dangerous to most of the civilian population and most likely a severe hazard to Maya's own health, Maya still let her live with her, even sleep with her in the same bed. Suicidal Maya was not, she just dreaded to see what would happen if Red was denied any form of access to herself. Besides, Red was kind of like a cute, albeit vicious, little puppy. Maya could almost see her perky ears and perpetually wagging tail whenever she eagerly asked a question or did what Maya told her to do. That kind of adoration made Maya feel a little fuzzy and warm on the inside, and while she would never admit that it might be her latent maternal instinct sluggishly stirring to life, she'd still take the opportunity to dote on Red and indulge her in whatever silliness or cuddles she wanted. Red was ultimately just a young girl with a slew of mental issues who just needed some kindness and compassion. 
or so she hoped. She knew things were never as simple as that. But if Red had made it New Haven, well, Maya had read the backgrounds of some of the settlers and it turned out that for many, New Haven was a second chance at life. And that was something she wanted to give Red a shot at. Hopefully, Maya thought to herself, Maya's own ruthlessness hadn't already screwed up Red's chance at redemption. Ruby waved goodbye to Vincent as she watched him and the workers head back into the settlement. Vincent raised his hand, acknowledging her, then walked through the gates, the large wooden structures closing shut behind him. After seeing how her campsite had been demolished by the blizzard, Vincent had left her some rations despite how she had reassured him that she would be fine. The two packs of hardtack and jerky probably wouldn't last her very long, considering her appetite, but she appreciated the thought as she chewed on them while running through the forest. The blizzard and the subsequent few feet of snow had made traveling by ground rather slow, so she was currently hopping from tree to tree. She usually wouldn't have had a problem, but the blizzard had deposited a considerable amount of snow on the branches. It wasn't too hard when there was actually a bit of daylight left, but now that the sun had set she was constantly slipping a little on landing or smashing into a branch when she misjudged the distance. But after a few mishaps and shattered trees, she eventually got the hang of it. It wasn't as though slamming into a few trees would hurt, after all, although she did use a bit of her aura to protect herself. No matter how dull her sense of pain was, she still didn't want to show up bloodied and bruised when she got back to Maya. In a few minutes she had arrived at her usual place and began sneaking across the snow once more. The depth of the snow had made her consider digging a tunnel underneath the fluffy whiteness, but after a few minutes of experimentation and a large amount of snow in her clothing she decided that the idea wasn't a very good one. As she slowly made her way toward the walls, she smoothed out the snow behind her as best as she could, trying to eliminate the tracks she had left behind. She couldn't completely eliminate them, of course, but she hoped that the guards on the walls would just dismiss them as animal tracks or grim tracks from a distance. Just to further muddy her trail, she doubled back to the forest, wandered a little from side to side, then ran toward the wall and did a running leap, slamming her side into the structure to anchor herself down and leaving no evidence of any footsteps approaching the wall and stopping. After shimmying a little from side to side, she found the previous handholds she had made and quickly climbed up the wall, then rappelled down the other side. The ruins of Maya's previous house was still there, a pile of wood and ash, and it took Ruby a moment to orient herself and remember the direction their new house was in. The only signs of the footsteps from the previous night were a few uneven patches in the snow, but that information along with Ruby's memory allowed her to retrace her steps to the new house she lived in. As she jogged down what might have been a path before the blizzard, she wondered, not for the first time today, if it had been okay to not go to work because of the storm. She didn't want to disappoint Maya by losing her job again right after getting it back, and she really did need the money to repay Maya and Roxy. Bits of light leaked through the cracks in the shutters of the house. The house itself was covered in snow and a bit dingy, but it was a sturdy structure overall and probably wouldn't collapse due to the weight of the remaining slow on the sloped roof. Ruby walked up to the door and knocked. It's me, she called, hoping that Maya would recognize her voice. She had an urge to just break the latches on the shutters and climb straight through them, but after the attacks she knew Maya was probably much more alert than she would be normally and Ruby didn't want to startle her. Come in. Maya responded. Ruby smiled to herself and opened the door. She didn't know if Maya realized, but having a place to return to, having someone to return to, made her happy in so many different ways. But the rising tensions, the enforcers being sent to attack them at night, and the possible upcoming faction war between the Faunus, those things worried her. They worried her because that meant that sweet, voluptuous Maya would be in danger, and that wouldn't do at all. Why are you licking your lips? Ruby blinked and focused back onto the present, where Maya was sitting on the couch, bundled in her blankets, as she looked up from the scroll in her hand. Ah, I was just thinking about dinner. Ruby grinned, her sharp teeth gleaming despite the dim light from the lantern. Kinda hungry. Maya shrugged and went back to swiping through her tablet. Of course you'd be. She smirked. I'm also going to ignore the weird emphasis on that last word. Your meat's in the fridge. Yes, Ruby hissed, giving herself a little fist pump. 
That heart attack and jerky really didn't fill her up much. Maya rolled her eyes. So, guess what I did today? Ruby took the meat out from the fridge. Police things. She tried. Answering Maya wasn't really a priority at the moment with the thick steaks in her hand. Yeah, police things, Maya answered. More accurately, I did things about our police department. Got the wall guards on our side by convincing the captain that shady things were happening, and also realized that we really need some spices because eating bland vegetables isn't very fun. Air, right, spices, Ruby said in a muffled voice around a chunk of raw steak. She grabbed a frying pan out of one of the cabinets, placed it onto the stove, and turned the stove on. Maya glared at her. Why do I have a feeling that you wouldn't even bother to cook your food if the steak was already warm? Nah, Ruby said, waving her hand. It's just your imagination. She reached for the barely seared steak in the pan. Maya cleared her throat. Fine, I'll use a fork or something. Ruby began rummaging through the cabinets, until she found a lone fork sitting sadly in one of the drawers. Just for you, though, Ruby clarified, brandishing the offending utensil at Maya. Maya sighed and wrapped herself a little more tightly in her sheets. Alright, so did you even hear the other things I said? Ruby shook her head, a bit of blood spraying from the rare chunk of meat impaled upon the comparatively tiny fork. Was that a no, or were you just trying to eat that thing? Maya scrunched her nose as the smell reached her. Also, please wipe the floor after you're done eating. Ruby mumbled a negative as her pointed teeth made short work of the meat. Maya glared at her. I mean, I didn't hear, Ruby hastily amended, swallowing her food. I'll clean it up, don't worry. Ah, Maya said. She relented and gave her a small smile. Ruby grinned back, relieved. So yeah, I talked to the wall guards today and got them and their captain onto our side. And therefore we need to get things moving quickly before the wall guards decide to take things into their own hands. A civil war in this settlement would turn extremely ugly, especially since the perpetrators could be hiding anywhere among the individual communities. So what can I do for you? Ruby asked eagerly, before taking another bite. The same thing you did, what, four nights ago? Maya hummed as she contemplated. With the blizzard, most of the emergency services have probably been overburdened or overworked. Some of the roads might still be blocked up or slippery, and the police are corrupt anyways. With no one out in the streets, it's pretty much the perfect time for Emmett and the other carnivores to resume their activities. Does this mean? Ruby almost began salivating at the thought, but managed to rein herself in. Finally, something to do. She mentally shook head. Focus, she told herself. Think about the long-term goals. She finished off the steak and put the pan in the sink. If she played this right, not only would she be able to enjoy herself, but she'd also be able to remove the threat to Maya's person. And in the end, Maya was a much greater prize than some paltry, random faunus who would be so much less brilliant than that gem of a rabbit faunus. And on that note, about threats to her person. The wolf faunus said that Sheriff Donig sent them after you, right? Ruby asked. Maya nodded. How was, um, your job today? No one attacked you or anything. Maya shook her head. No. I'd probably be dead if they suspected that I went to get help from the wall guards, but after that attempt I think Don is settling for sending me a message. He probably thinks that losing more agents, attackers, whatever, by sending people after me again won't be worth it, and I'm sure he's trying to figure out other methods of disposing of me. Maya shrugged. I'm still on good terms with some other members of the police department. Getting them to attack me would shake things up too much. Honestly, if he wanted me dead I'd probably expect him to poison me or get someone to ambush and kidnap me. Ruby whipped her head around to stare at her, the metal handle of the frying pan squealing as Ruby tightened her grip. That can't happen, she said plainly. That's not going to happen. Maya, can you please reconsider going to work? You can take a few days off, right? Maya got up from the couch, keeping the blanket draped over her shoulders. Calm down, Red, she said, walking sedately over to Ruby and placing her hands on Ruby's shoulders. Don't be so worried. Ruby blushed and stared resolutely down at the wet pan in her hands as Maya's chest pressed against her back. Just a few more days, Maya promised. We don't know their locations, so we have to avoid tipping them off to anything. 
Convince Emmett to bring you along again. Get the location of their safe house. Find out about the next time they're going to meet and what they're going to hit, and then we call the wall guards down on them. Meanwhile, I'll use this time to grab more files and reports and determine who the worst offenders are and who they're associated with. How does that sound? Ruby nodded furiously as she wiped at the pan with a towel and set it aside before turning and plunging herself into Maya's embrace. Okay, she whispered, but please, please stay safe. I don't know what I'd do without you. There, there, Maya whispered, stroking her hair. Ruby felt a light shudder run through Maya's body. I don't think I want to know what would happen either.